Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnson and welcome to lecture 6 of Advanced Linear Algebra, which is all about coordinate vectors. Now this is where we start to actually see why bases are useful. Remember last uh, last lecture we went over bases, which are just sets of vectors that, that both span the vector space in question and also are linearly independent. And now we're going to look at why we like sets of vectors that have those two properties, what actually makes them useful. And our starting point, really sort of the impetus for this entire lecture, is this first theorem here that we're going to go through. Okay, so the setup is the same as sort of most of the setup setups that we're going to see this week. Uh, so you got some vector space and you've got B, which is a basis of that vector space. And then what happens is it turns out no matter which vector you choose in that vector space, there's exactly one way to write that vector as a linear combination of the vectors from B. Okay. Now, because B you know, it spans all of V and also it's linearly independent, in particular because it spans V, it's obvious that you can write V as a linear combination of the members of B, right? Because if B spans V, then, well, just by definition, everything in V can be written as a linear combination of the things in B. That's what spans mean. Span is a set of all linear combinations. So really sort of the content of this theorem is that there's exactly one way to write V as a linear combination of the members from B, okay? And that's sort of where the other piece of bases are, is going to come in. That's where linear independence is going to come in. All right, so how do we prove this theorem? Well, again, just what I said, since B spans V, we can find some vectors in B and some scalars such that V is linear combination of things from B. All right, and now what we want to do is we want to suppose, suppose that there's some other linear combination for V as well, okay? Suppose there's some other way to write V as a linear combination of the things in B, okay? So here's what we've just written down, some other way. And now we want to come up with a contradiction, or maybe not quite a contradiction, but we want to show that these coefficients then must be the same as these coefficients. We want to show that these Ds must be the same as Cs. So in other words, we want to show that this linear combination that we started with is actually unique. There's only one of them. Okay, the way that we've got to do that is we've just got to use the only other property of bases available to us. We've already used the fact that bases span V. Okay, so now we've got to use linear independence. Okay, so what we're going to do is we've got two equations for V here, this one and this one, and we're just going to subtract them from each other and see what we get. Okay, if we subtract them from each other, in other words, if we do V minus V, but in two different ways, well, one way, V minus V is just the zero vector, right? Any vector minus itself is the zero vector. But if we do this linear combination minus this linear combination, then we get this expression over on the right. We just get a linear combination of V1 up to Vn, where now the coefficients of that linear combination are the Cs minus the Ds. Okay, And now if we use the fact that B is linearly independent, well, this is a linear combination of members of B that equals zero. So we know from linear independence that all of these coefficients in the linear combination must be zero as well, right? That's what linear independence means. It means if you have a linear combination that gives you the zero vector, all your coefficients must be zero, all right? So by linear independence of B, each of these coefficients equals zero. So in other words, each of the C's equals the corresponding D's, CJ equals DJ for all J. So yeah, this linear combination really is the same as this linear combination. So linear combinations, really are unique when you're taking them with respect to a basis. Okay, so linear combinations with respect to a basis are unique. Okay, and sort of the intuition here is that what bases do is they, they specify directions in vector spaces, sort of non-overlapping directions. Just like on the Earth, we sort of measure things in like an east-west direction and north-south direction, and those two directions, like you can specify every point on the Earth, well, not only can you write every point on the Earth sort of as a linear combination of an east-west direction and north-south direction, like you can say, you know, it's this many degrees this way and this many degrees that way, but actually that's unique as well. You're never going to have two different coordinates that specify the same point, all right? And that's sort of what this theorem is saying here. Bases, not only do they span a vector space, but the linear combinations are unique. So really we can think of each members of the basis as a direction and there's sort of not overlap between them. There's no redundancies there. Okay, if you have different linear combinations, then they specify different points. All right, and so we're going to sort of jump off of this and sort of run with this idea. This is where we're going now. We're, we're going to think of these basis vectors as specifying directions, and then the, the coefficients in the linear combination specify how far you go in that direction, or they specify coordinates, in other words. All right, so now our next definition is just sort of trying to pin all of this down a little bit. Suppose, again, standard setup, you've just got some vector space over some field, and you've got some finite basis, okay? I'll talk about why I'm saying ordered here in a minute. Just ignore it for now, but you've got some finite basis. 
and then some vector in the vector space. All right, then by the previous theorem, we know that there are some unique scalars such that I can write V as a linear combination of the things from B, okay? And those scalars, they're uniquely determined by that basis. All right, so, well, these unique scalars, we call them the coordinates of the vector V. Again, we think of them as specifying how far you have to go in each of these n different directions, okay, to get to V. All right, and well, because often we just care about those different coordinates, okay, and the, the basis vectors just sort of fade into the background, what we're gonna do is we're gonna collect those coordinates, those coefficients, into a vector. So what we do is we're defining a vector here, you know, a vector in the sense of an n-tuple, in the sense of, you know, rn or something like that. We, we're defining this vector where we just collect n numbers together, c1 up to cn. We call that the coordinate vector of v with respect to b, okay? And we introduce this new notation for that vector, okay? And sort of the idea here is we're starting off with a vector v that's just in some arbitrary abstract vector space. And we would like a way of describing or talking about that vector using just real numbers. Okay, and this is how we do it. We fix some basis of the, that abstract vector space, okay, and then we write v as a linear combination of those vector of those uh, basis vectors, and then we say, oh well, these coefficients here, those completely specify the vector. Those completely specify v. Once I know these coefficients, these c's, then I can reconstruct v exactly using this basis. All right. So really, I just need to keep track of these n numbers here to know everything about v which is maybe a bit more familiar because we're used to working with numbers. We're, we're used to working with vectors in Rn. Okay, so it just sort of provides a bridge between abstract vector spaces and, you know, more concrete ones like R, Rn. And again, we'll talk about all, all of these things a lot more. It's just sort of the start of a common theme that we're going to see over the next several lectures. Okay. And before we start doing some examples, it, it's sort of important to note um, that arithmetic uh, with these coordinate vectors works sort of how you might expect it to, okay, or how we might hope for it to. Okay, if you if you take the coordinate vector of the sum of two vectors, that's the same as taking coordinate vectors of them individually and then adding them up. And similarly with scalar multiplication, it doesn't matter if you do it before or after you compute the coordinate vector of what you're working with. Okay, so scalars and vector addition uh, both pull out. Of, uh, of coordinate vectors. All right, well, let's do a couple quick examples of constructing coordinate vectors. All right, so let's find the coordinate vector of this polynomial in the space P2 of degree less than or equal to two polynomials. And we always have to specify a basis when we do this. Construct a coordinate vector, well, you need a basis. So the basis we're gonna use this time is just the standard basis, one x, x squared. All right, and what this means is find me the coefficients uh, of these three vectors here when I write P as a linear combination of them. So write P as a linear combination of one X and X squared, and then just keep track of what coefficients you have when you do that. And well, it's just sitting right here in front of us. P is four times one minus one times X plus three times X squared. So my coordinate vector is just those coefficients written down in a vector. It's four minus one, three. You can just read them directly off of here. Okay, and that's kind of why we like the standard the standard basis of these various vector spaces in the first place, because coordinate vectors, you can just read them off from the coefficients in the definition of the thing. Okay, more generally, if you're working in higher dimensional polynomial spaces, if you have some polynomial that's a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared and so on up to a p x to the power p, that's a degree less than or equal to p polynomial and their standard basis this time is one x x squared up to x to the power p, then your, co your coordinate vector, it's just well, you just read off the coefficients in that linear combination, right? And that gets you your coordinate vector. All right, now, one thing that we've got to be a little bit careful about with coordinate vectors and bases that we haven't addressed yet, but we really should, is coordinate vectors, they depend on the order of the basis vectors. And this is kind of janky. We're abusing notation a little bit here because we're using set notation for bases but really with bases, we care about the order of vectors, even though with sets you don't, right? But we use the same curly set braces for bases with the understanding that whenever we work with bases, yeah, we really do care about orders. We, we care about the order of the vectors. We consider it an ordered basis, okay? So if we go back to this previous example, we worked with the basis one x, x squared, and we got this coordinate vector four minus one, three. Well, if we flip things around now a little bit, use the exact same polynomial, but now we use the basis x squared x1, so we just swap the order of the basis vectors. 
then now our coordinate vector is gonna change, okay? It's the same, same polynomial P, but our coordinate vector is different because now we're asking, well, what is the coordinate of X squared in this polynomial? Well, it's three. And then what is the coordinate of X? Well, it's minus one. And then what is the coordinate of one? It's four. So the order of the coefficients in these coordinate vectors has just swapped. Okay, because the order of the basis vectors changed. Okay, so not only do coordinate uh, vectors depend on which basis you're using, but it depends on which ordering of the basis vectors you're using. So you have to be a little bit careful about that. All right. So yeah, when you have the standard basis, everything works nicely. You can just sort of read off coefficients from your polynomial or your matrix or whatever to get your coordinate vector. But let's do an example now where we're using some basis that is not the standard basis, okay? So again, same polynomial, but now we've got an uglier basis. And we showed that this actually is a basis of P2 in the last lecture. So now let's go through and construct a, the coordinate vector of this with respect to this basis. Now, the way that you do this when you're not working with a standard basis anymore, really, again, what you're asking is, you're asking, how can I write this, my vector, as a linear combination of my basis vector? So how can I write P as C1 times basis vector plus C2 times basis vector plus C3 times basis vector? That's the question, right? And then once we solve that problem, once we find a C1, C2, and C3 that work, we just collect those numbers together in a vector and we call it the coordinate vector. All right, so let's go through it. Let's go through, see how this works. Again, we've done this sort of calculation a couple times already. The way that you check that two polynomials are equal to each other is you just match up coefficients, okay? So let's look at all the x, x squared terms. I got three over on the left, and I've got c2 plus c3 over on the right. So that gives me three equals c2 plus c3. That's my first equation in a linear, in a linear system that I'm gonna solve. All right, then the next equation comes from the x coefficient. I've got minus one equals c1, plus C3, so that's my second equation. And then the constant term is just four equals C1 plus C2. Okay, so that's my third equation. That gives me a three by three linear system. Here it is in augmented matrix form. And then I just go through Gauss-Jordan elimination and I solve it, okay? So I'm not gonna go through the details here. You learned how to solve linear systems last course, but you end up with this as your reduced row echelon form. And what that tells you is C1 equals zero, C2 equals four, and C3 equals minus one. Remember the columns of the, this, uh, these augmented matrix correspond to the, the different variables in your linear system, which are C1, C2, and C3 in this case. All right, so those are my Cs. So therefore, the coordinate vector of my polynomial is just, well, you stick those Cs in a vector, okay? So C1, then C2, then C3, that's my coordinate vector. Okay, with respect to that basis. And again, all that means is that this polynomial here, it's zero times this first basis vector plus four times the second one plus minus one times the third one. In other words, to get to this vector in that vector space, you have to go a distance of zero in this direction and then four in that direction and then minus one in that direction. Okay. And that's all there is to it. So we'll see a lot more of coordinate vectors from this point on because sort of the idea is that they let us turn linear, calcul linear algebra calculations in weird vector spaces, like polynomial vector spaces, into calculations just involving lists of numbers, which is maybe more familiar from previous linear algebra. So it's a more comfortable setting for us to work in. All right, so that's it for this lecture. I will see you all next time.